I'm Sarah, and I'm a critical care and pulmonology PA, and this is my twin sister. I'm Kristen. I'm a cardiology PA. And we work at the same hospital. We see a lot of sick patients, and we read EKGs a lot, Kristen more than me. But today we're going to be talking about EKGs, how to approach it simply, and then we're going to talk about different rhythms, signs of ischemia, and just kind of give you a good overview of EKGs. Kristen will be talking for the most of it because she's the queen of EKGs, but we'll go from here. If you need to ask questions, you can unmute and ask a question. It's very casual, or you can message in the chat. Either is fine. Does anyone have any questions before we start? No? Okay. A lot of people really wanted this topic, so it's exciting to be able to talk about this. Okay. Um, So geez, it's a lot. I mean, for us, it was a several week course where we went over EKGs and how to read them and interpret them. A lot of, I work with two electrophysiologists who specialize in EKGs and they've spent many years studying it. So it's it's a big breadth of knowledge to know, especially when you get in the details. So I'm going to try to go over a lot in an hour. And my assumption is that we've already, you know, we know the basics, but I've also included a little intro just in case we haven't. And then we'll try to talk about mostly what's covered in the pants and in your EORs, but also I'll give you some clinical just tips that I've learned on the job and in training. I'm not an expert in EKGs. I'm learning every day. So if I don't know an answer to your question or I'm not sure, I'll definitely get back with you and run it by a cardiologist if I need to. So with all that said, EKGs are the most commonly used non-invasive cardio cardiac diagnostic tool. A lot of people that come into the ER, the first thing they get is an EKG. And from it, we can amazingly derive all this information. Like we can see if a patient has an enlarged heart, if they have ischemia going on, what their heart rate and rhythm's like, if they have some electrical abnormalities, and if even we can look at, see signs of drug toxicity from an EKG. And, you know, using a a similar approach each time you look at an EKG is important because you don't want to miss anything. There's been times when I'm forgotten to look at the inferior leads and you don't want to miss an ST elevation in the inferior leads. So making sure you look at every single lead and look at the PQRST complex and making sure you do it the same every time is important, but also really important is that we take into context the clinical picture because sometimes it may not match up like you think it can. And, you know, there's like, for example, there's several different causes of ST segment elevation and a patient may not be having an MI, but the EKG interpretation says acute MI, but it may not be so. So just making sure that we always take that into context is very important. So we'll go over a little bit of cardiac electrophysiology. Let's see here. Oh, there's nine people waiting to be admitted. Sorry, I'm not very good at this. I'm moving on. Okay, so so back then in the 1900s, this guy who came up with the EKG invention, he was doing it with with buckets of water with electrolyte solutions. And he was like putting their lint, like, people's limbs and different like buckets of water and trying to simulate like an electrical potential from that. And now we don't have to, you know, give our patients like do that for our patients. We can just put a little sticker on their chest. And so that's a lot easier now. So that's why we do it a lot. It's very easy to do. An electrode is what it's conducting that electricity that's coming from the heart. And from that, we can record these electrical currents. And it's, these we have, there's 10 electrodes and you should know kind of like the area they're in, you know, and how to put those leads and stickers on a patient because it, based on those electrodes and how we compare the two electrodes, we get a lead and that lead is what is on the EKG paper. So, so let's see, I'm trying to see. If so if you look at the top right picture, these are stickers V1 or like we put leads in spots where we can see V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. These are the chest leads, right? So this is looking at the electrical activity of the heart in a transverse plane. So when you have electricity that goes from the SA node down to the AV node through the bundle of his, through the left and right bundle branch blocks and to the Purkinje fibers, that net electricity, that like the vector of all that is going down to the left of the heart. And when we have electricity going towards an electrode, a positive pole, we get an upward deflection. So that's why on this top right picture, if you look at V4 and V5, it's an upward deflection. Do you notice that? Because the net electricity current is going to that area. Whereas if you look at V1, for example, it's the deflection of that waveform is negative, meaning the electricity is not going that way. It's going away from that. 
So that's the basic principles of proteograms is like we're measuring these electricity currents and we're looking at if there, it's a positive or negative deflection and then how long that lasts. So the duration. And that's why we use time is the x-axis on the electrocardiogram and then voltage is the y-axis. So that's very important to understand. And then the limb leads are all the ones I listed here. It gets a little complicated here because there's unipolar and bipolar limb leads and you're comparing the poles in different ways. But essentially, if you look at the bottom right picture, these are the, the stickers going to like the right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg. The right leg is the ground. So we don't actually use that. It's just stabilized electricity. And then we're comparing the poles based on where they're at and where the positive and negative is. And then from this, we get a graph that Sarah will talk about a little bit, which is the axial like reference system, the circle that you may have seen before. And that's how we look at a left and right axis deviation. Is there any questions about this? This was a very quick overview. I, I could get nitty gritty, but I don't want to. Hey, Kristen, there's a few yeah. people needing to be admitted to the okay. meeting. Do you know how to get to that? No, how do I get to that? It should kind of say in the right top corner, like a oh, list of people. Once someone just messaged me, so and you just put a submit all. Do you see it? Yeah, I got it. I'm so okay. sorry if I, you've been waiting to be admitted. Normally Sarah does this, so I apologize. This is recorded, so if you missed the first section, you can definitely go back and watch it. You'll never just be would... able to see it again. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so moving on. So like I said, we're looking... We're looking at the duration, the amplitude, and the direction of electricity. That's how it all boils down to no matter how complicated EKGs get. And so like I talked about before, on the top right, we see a picture of the heart and electrical, you know, the basic conduction system, and then how it corresponds to the upward and negative deflections on an EKG, which is represented by the PQRST complex. So P wave is represented by what cardiac event? What's happening when we get a P wave that's an up, slight upward deflection, atrial depolarization, good. And then we get repolarization and it's not significant enough to simulate a, an upward or negative wave. So it's flat, it's isoelectric. And then we have, what's the QRS? This like basic cardiac. And then we have ventricle depolarization, good. And often you should know that the Q wave does not, there's so many morphologies for a QRS complex. It's not always QRS. It could be RS, it could be RR. It could be RSR, you know, but a note that a Q wave always precedes an R wave. There can never be a Q wave after an R wave. It's always an S wave after an R wave. And that will come important when you talk about pathological Q waves. And then we also talk about hypertrophy that comes into play. And then, then we have the ST segment. And why is that important? What can we, what are we looking for with an ST segment? Good, and STEMI versus STEMI. So it's, I was the electrical properties of the heart are different when the heart's in a state of ischemia in certain areas and perfusion in others, and it messes up that, that, that part of the EKG. And so there's changes, whether that be ST elevation or ST depression. And that measuring that is starts at what point? What do we call that? Like right here, the J point. Good. So at the end of the QRS complex, we start measuring that ST segment elevation depression at this J point. And then we have the T wave, which is a sign of the repolarization. And if it's inverted, that can be pathologic. It can be normal as well. Flat, two waves can be flattened or two waves can be really, really tall and peaked, which can be a sign of ischemia or a very serious electrolyte abnormality. Does anybody else know what that is? What yeah. electrolyte? Yeah. Good, perfect, hyperkalemia. Yeah, so that would be a finding there. So that's basic electro cardiac electrophysiology. Does anybody have any questions about that? Is that something you've been over already in your in your program? Yes, good, okay. Anybody else, any questions? And I will move forward. Okay, so interpreting EKGs. So, you know, here's, you, everyone has their own way of doing it. I've looked up several different websites and they all have different, and books, and they have different, you know, recommendations to how to approach reading an EKG. This is what I typically do, depending on the patient, but, you know, doing the same thing every th time, especially when you're starting off is helpful so you don't miss anything. This makes the most sense to me. So. Sarah, or I'll start with this. So the first thing they always say is to make sure that it's the right patient, the right date, the right time, and then that the, the EKG paper has been calibrated because you can miss, it can falsely show really high voltage. You're like, oh my goodness, this patient has left ventral hypertrophy when it's actually just not calibrated. Or you think they have really low voltage and they have like a pericardial fusion and then it's just like not calibrated, right? So 
making sure that the standard speed is set at 25 millimeters per second, and then that the height one millivolt per 10 millimeters is set is essential. And also making sure that like, I always try to look for a previous CKG on my patients because comparing the two is very helpful, especially if they're coming in with something different and concerning. So that's, these two images are kind of showing you where you can see that on EKG. And that's the first thing, very simple. And then Sarah's gonna go through this. Okay, so determining the rate, a lot of times the EKG, when you get an EKG A12 bleed, they'll read it for you and say, it'll tell you the rate. So you don't necessarily have to do this, but I think it's good practice to be able to know how to tell the rate by yourself without a machine telling you. So you look to see where a QRS, you look through all the QRSs and you find one that's on one of the bigger, thick red lines. You start there and then you just count down. You go from 300 to 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. And wherever the next QRS ends up is the rate. So we see right here, the next QRS is around 50. So we could say roughly that's like 55 um, beats per minute. If this were moved over over here, like on this thick red line on 100, it would be like, okay, 300, 150, 100. And then if the QRS were there, you know, that would be like hundred beats per minute. So really it's a simple way, just this, just memorize those big numbers and you sh should be able to roughly tell the rate. And then also sometimes you can just eye it and know, like if you see QRS that are like very, very close together, you're like, oh, that's definitely a tacky arrhythmia, or you can just tell sometimes, but this is a good way to determine the rate. So yeah. There's other ways too. There's like four total ways to tell the rate, but that's, I, that's the one I found to be the most simple and just makes sense. And then after determining the rate, then now we determine the rhythm. So I think the most important question to ask when we're looking at EKG is this normal sinus rhythm or not? That's the per pretty much the most important question you can ask, because if you know it's normal sinus rhythm, you know a lot, like, you know, like, oh, this is an AFib. This is not an AD block. Like, you know, like what it's not, and that's important. So, and then once you determine is the sinus or not sinus, well, basically to determine if it's sinus rhythm is to know, is there a P wave to every QRS complex? So as you're going through the EKG, you go through each one and say like, hey, is there a P wave associated with the QRS complex or not? And if it's not, then that's not sinus rhythm. And then also you wanna look at the pattern of the QRS complexes. Is it regular? So are they regularly spaced out? You can get your little caliber. I'm not sure if y'all used it in school, but we were all given calibers. You can get a caliber and like make sure they're evenly spaced out and that would be regular or if they're irregularly spaced out, you're like, oh, this could be like AFib or some, something else. It could be like even like a sinus arrhythmia or like when people take a deep breath, their QRS complexes often like change and it may look irregular. So does that make sense? Do you have anything to add on that, Kristen? No, that was good. Okay, so yeah, just make sure it just, when you look at the rhythm, is this sinus rhythm or not? Is there a P wave to a QRS? And what is the pattern of those QRS complexes? Are they equally spaced or not? So that's basically kind of a generalized, like surface level kind of evaluation of the rhythm. And then next is access. So to be quite frank and honest on exams and on tests, on the pants and your cardiology classes, it's very, access is important. I know we spent like a ton of time going over how to determine access, which is basically um, the sum of the depolarization and what direction all the electricity is going. So like Kristen explained, Electricity usually goes in a direction towards from the right to the left, like downward like that from the SA node, AB node, bundle of his, bundle branches, Purkinje fibers. And that's a normal axis. You would expect that. But if the heart enlarges or like, let's say someone has a big left-sided heart, the electricity will shift. And that, that means the axis will shift. And so that would be like left axis deviation, which is commonly seen in LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy. If someone has like chronic RD failure or like acute PE or something wrong with the right side of their heart, it will shift to the right. And we call that right axis deviation. Clinically, I don't think it's that important on a, we were, Chris and I were talking about this, even from a cardiology and critical care standpoint, it's not a huge deal to be able to, to determine access. I don't like freak out if someone has left axis deviation, but I think for in the classroom, it's important. So I'll kind of go over how I determine it. And this, if you haven't gone over this, it may just make it look kind of confusing, but I promise it's easier than what it looks like. So when we determine access, there's a lot of people teach some different methods. This is the method I found to be the most helpful. I always look at lead one, lead ABF, and then lead two. So always start with one. So we go back and we look at lead one and we, the question we ask ourselves is, is this a positive deflection of the QRS or negative deflection? So if we see it's positive, 
we're like, okay, electricity is going towards that lead or that hole. And so it's going towards that right side. So we can say with certainty it's on that right side of the circle, the quadrant, because it's pointing that way. And then we look at AB. So we know from that it's either a normal QRS or left axis deviation because it's on that side. Does that make sense? Okay, if not, I can stop. And then after looking at lead one, we look at lead ABF and that's on the left foot. Oh, and the, just FYI, lead one's on the, typically like on the left arm, but ABF. And so we look at ABS and we ask ourselves, is this QRS complex positively deflected? So is the QRS up or is it down or negatively deflected? So let's just say, for example, it's positive. So the picture right there, ABF, so it's going up. So we're like, okay, that means electricity is going down towards the foot in a positive way, hitting that electrode. And so that means the QRS complex is positively deflecting. So that's on the bottom half of that circle, the positive QRS. So if we go back to the picture, we can say, we now know it's basically, that means it's a normal axis because we know it's on the bottom half of the circle and on the right side of that circle. So normal axis is between negative 30 and 90, positive 90. So it is a normal axis. And then, so that's that. It's hard to it's explain. Like, it's very hard. It's like the net. It's um, a net I always charge think of like, everything. Where, like, when I look at a 12 lead, I'm trying to look at axis and do it really quickly. I'm like, where is the most positively deflected QRS complex on the limb leads? And that's typically where the axis is pointed. I just look at all the limb leads. I'm like, which one's the most positive? And, and that's where I kind of know, like, where that angle is going. Because that's the... Like the, all the vectors are going that way. Yeah. Yeah. So I but have a this lot is of, the more systematic way. <laughs> yeah. It's a systematic approach. If you do it this way, I have all the examples of all the different scenarios that would happen. It's like one was positively deflected and ABF was negative. And what if both were negative and stuff like that? I think the main takeaway is that in real life, this may not be as helpful, but in practice, on your exam, it, yeah. I would definitely know this for sure. It could show up on the pants for sure. Definitely a cardiology exam. So just take time to practice this. If you don't understand it, let us know and we can do like practice questions. I can even like type up a little sheet, but basically we look at lead one, we look at lead ABF. And then lastly, there is a scenario when we would look at lead two and that's just to determine if it's a, there's kind of a gray area where we're unsure if it's left axis deviation or normal QRS and lead two can tell us the difference. If two is also positive, that means it's normal access. If ABF and lead one are also positive. So the thumb trick. Yeah. I, I, we, I think we're, I didn't, I didn't learn thumb tricks either. Uh, with Kristen, I think we're, I remember us doing these hand motions in class and I think I just got confused. I'm not quite doing like the YMCA or something in class yeah. when you're learning this. I, I mean, really, I mean, I think in PA school and in life, you just got to find out what works for you. What makes it, what makes it click to you? What makes it under, like, what makes you understand it? Cause can you, you explain it's just this last one, just because they're both negative? Yeah, yeah. So I look at the QRS and lead one, it's negatively deflected. So we're like, oh, that's shifted away from that left arm. It's on the, the other side of that circle. So it's we know it's on that, it's a pointing that way. And then we look at ABF and it's negative two. And so that's pointing away from that left foot. So it's, it's kind of bouncing back. So we're like, oh, it's up here on the top half of the circle. And so where those overlap is what the axis is. So they overlap in that area over here, that kind of purplish color. And we call that extreme right axis deviation because both of them are negatively deflected. You wouldn't expect that it's not a normal heart. They probably have some, like they might have some RV failure, who knows, but axis is, it's not clinically that helpful, but I think it's, well, it's, you should know it. Does anybody have any questions about the access? Yeah. We went through those. Okay. And then secondly, or fifthly, we have the, looking at the PQRS T complex. So this is my favorite part of looking at EKG, one of mine. Well, yeah. And so it's very helpful to know the numbers for each interval or duration, because if it's abnormal, you need to know it. So like a normal PR interval, I don't know why it said 0.22 seconds typically and why there's commas and not dots. Anyway, sorry. But typically it's between 0.12 and 0.2. So if anything's greater than five boxes in this PR interval, then it's considered a prolonged PR interval, which we can talk, we'll talk about later in terms of AB block. But look at the P wave. Is it upright? Is it inverted? Are all the P wave morphologies the same? Look at the PR interval. Is it normal? Is it within the normal range? If is it, is it shortened? Is it prolonged? Those could be pathological. And then looking at 
the the QRS complex? Is it wide? Is it narrow? Is it tall? Is it like short? And so we're looking at, we need to know that anything greater than three small boxes or 0.12 seconds is considered wide, a wide QRS complex, which, you know, has a lot of, is is not great and, and many certain things, but like, what do you mean it, by that? Meaning like, <laughs> Like if someone has heart failure and they have a QRS complex that's widening over time, I can assume that their EF is actually getting worse based on that because the ventricles are taking longer to contract. And so when I look at the whole time I've been here, so that's right. So that that can be concerning. However, someone has a a right bundle branch. I think someone's speaker is on. Hey, Kristen, you can 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 underactive. You click on their name and you can. I mean, it's Maria. It's not Sorry, going. Maria, we're going to mute you. Oh, my. I don't know. There's like I a, don't, there's a but I don't know who that is. Can you find the name Maria? Oh, sorry. That's okay. No, you it's okay. It? You're so fine. It's okay. Thank you. Sorry to call you out. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So that's when I would be concerned. But if someone has a right bundle branch block, which can be benign and normal, like, I, like you know, and healthy people, they can just have a right bundle branch block. Their QRS is wide. That's what defines the right bundle. So that wouldn't be concerning. So those are things we think about with a wide QRS. And then and the ST segment, which we spoke about earlier, how that is a big indicator of ischemia, whether it be like an ST elevation, myocardial infarction, or ST depression, which can be a sign of sub endocardial uh, ischemia. But note that those two things, ST segment elevation and depression, don't always mean ischemia. There's many different causes of those two things. And and knowing that is very helpful in your pants and your EOR, but also in the clinic setting. And then the T wave, looking to make sure if it's upright, if it's the T waves are really peaked and tall, if they're flattened or inverted. And then I always look at the QT interval, which the EKG machine typically calibrates for you. So you don't have to calculate the QT and they will do a corrected QT interval. So it'd be the QTC and seeing that if that's prolonged in, in patients. So that's looking at the PQRST complex in a nutshell and looking at each individual segment and seeing if there's anything abnormal in that. Is there any questions about any particular part of this, these intervals or these duration segments or waves? Okay. Well, can you say again, what's an abnormal QRS width and then what's an abnormal PR interval? Just because yes. that's always really important in tests. And- yeah. So if I, PR interval, I typically just count boxes because it's a little bit easier, but anything starting from the beginning of the P wave to the where the Q or R wave, depending on if the patient has that or not in that lead to there, that point, if it's five boxes, if it's more than five boxes, then it's considered prolonged. And then if it's less than three, it's considered shortened. And then as far as the QRS complex go or RS, if they don't have, you know, Q waves are not always there. You can't always think on that being there. Often they're not. But if that's wider than three small boxes or 0.12 seconds, then that's considered abnormal. So those are very two high yield things. And then what can cause diffuse ST segment elevations that's not ischemia? That's great great question. Yeah. So Perry. Oh, do you want them to answer? Yeah, but you kind of said a little oh, bit. Oh, no. Of it. Well, I mean, there's other things. If yeah, you have a, that's true. If you, what are some things that can cause ST segment elevation? Because there's a quite Pericardi- a lengthy list. Okay, good. Yeah, like a pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade. I had a patient that came into the ER with chest pain. He had diffuse ST segment elevations. So they took him to the cath lab, thought he had an occlusion. His cath was clean, meaning his arteries were fine and he had pericarditis. And so, anyway, yeah, just wanted to point that out. And then Prince metals. So that's very true. Like transient, like coronary vasospasms can early ventricular repolarization definitely can. If someone has a left bundle branch block, they like, technically it looks like they have ST segment elevation, but they really don't. And then a stress cardiomyopathy, tacosubos can also cause them ST segment elevation. That looks exactly like an acute MI. And then AN29291 said, the longer the QT segment, the more likely a patient can develop BFib or BTAC. So yeah, if someone has a long QTC, that can make them go into torsade state points, which is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which means they go into BTAC, but the morphology of each QRS complex is different. So it looks very wonky. So yes, that's true. And then when you say, no, that's definitely true. Yes, that's right. And then someone asked, what what does it mean by diffuse? When we say diffuse, we mean that's like across all like a lot of the leads like there's not 
it's not just like the interior leads or the inferior leads. It's most of them. Yeah. Multifocal polymorphic, same thing. Yeah. The same thing. Polymorphic means each like versus monomorphic. Okay. So that's that we'll go into that a little bit more. So here's this, we'll go in. This is like, this is what I said, but in word form or written down. So anyway, and then Sarah will go over this. Yeah, so LVH and RVH, if you look at EKG, there's these criteria that I think is important to memorize. I'm not going to really go too much in depth over them, but the leads we look at for LVH and RVH are typically V1 and V2 and then V5, V6. And they're basically opposite. The trick is if you go to the next slide, in LV hypertrophy, we look at V1 and V2, there's these massive S waves and then poor R wave progression. And then we get to LV or V5, V6, and there's these really, really big R waves. So, and then the, the opposite is with right ventricular hypertrophy. So we look at V1, V2, they actually have these tall R waves. And then in V5, V6, we see these massive S waves. So they're basically flip-flops. So that's a trick. LVH and RVH are basically flip-flops if you just look at V1, V2, and then V5, V6. Anything to add there, Kristen? Good. No? Yeah. Okay. And then also for LVH, sorry, looking at a little bit quicker, if there's more than 11 millimeters or... 11 small boxes and height of the QRS complex and that's the H. Yeah. And then the, with the criteria, I didn't go over, but it's like, there is like a specific number of boxes that actually qualify or count as LVH versus RVH. If we want to be very technical. Yes. So yeah. Okay. And then I did like assessing for other things and on the EKG, like looking, I mean, not going to go over this, but like right and left atrial enlargement, you can look at the P wave morphologies V1 and Lee two. And that's the best, those are the best leads to look at the P wave. And there's criteria for th that as well. And then our way progression, you know, there's something like left, there's vesicular blocks. We're looking at for out for Wolf Parkinson White, somewhere like zebras here. And then also this, I see a lot of this people with pacemakers and their pacing spikes on the EKG. And uh, especially when you're in the clinical setting, knowing what that looks like. So you're able to interpret it correctly. And then someone said, would you say it's easy to see without... Tiny the boxes. Yeah, I I do the eyeball test, but is that what you're talking about? You can't count the boxes just to be sure. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, hey, Kristen, can you just go back to that list again about what, how do we approach the EKG just so one more time, they'll see what kind of to do each time. Just like one more time, just run through like we, I'll, or I can do it. You can go through it. Yeah. Okay. So it's really just make sure the EKG paper is legit, not really wonky and it's calibrated correctly. Look at the rate. Make, are they tachycardic, they bradycardic, they normal? Look at the rhythm. Is this normal sinus or not normal sinus? Is there QRS, P weight to every QRS? And then look at the QRS, P QRST complex. What does it look like? And Kristen explained there what things to look out for, the intervals, the, like ST segment elevations, T wave inversion, stuff like that. Look to see if there's enlargement of the heart and then look for other abnormalities. And did I forget access? Did I say access? Yeah, I mean, there are access in there. <laughs> yeah, there are access in there. I don't, I technically don't use it a lot just because a lot of people in the ICU and in the hospital get echocardiograms and that can tell us a lot about they have LVH or RVH, but you can for hoots look at the access. So uh, electrolyte abnormalities. Yeah, so that's a good question, Claire. So any, what the rule of thumb that I remember anything that causes like a long QTC interval, typically these are low electrolyte issues. So like hypokalemia, hyponatremia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesium, magnesium, uh, all the low electrolyte abnormalities or low levels of electrolytes equals a long QTC. And that's just like a general rule of thumb that I've, that I've learned. So yeah, hypocalcemia, good. Uh, okay. Yeah, hopefully that's Very helpful. Good. So the lower the electrolytes, the longer the QTC, just inversely related. And then, and so, oh, go ahead. And then on the pants and on EORs, there, now that y'all are mentioning this, it's I'm reminding me, there are like a lot of questions about electrolyte issues and what EKG findings that they reveal. And I think that is important to look at because the fact that if, a, if the electrolyte, electrolyte abnormality is severe enough to cause EKG finding, then that means it's pretty bad. So I think it is important to go over that. We can, I can post like a cheat sheet to kind of go over each electrolyte issue and what EKG finding you would find. I think that would be helpful for y'all. So I'll make that and post it because I think that is clinically and just in didactic important. So, okay, Kristen, you can keep going. Yeah, that's good. And like at, when I work, a lot of times the first thing 
one of the first things I'll do is I'll always check electrolytes before and when a patient's in a certain arrhythmia or there's some changes just to make sure they're, they're, they're not entirely abnormal or at least see if we can replace it and help. Oh, yeah, internal yeah. med. So here's an example of like of a case I see quite frequently. So 34 year old male with a history of obstructive sleep apnea, not wearing CPAP and hypertension, presents ER with chest pain. His lab work shows a BMP elevated and a slightly elevated troponin, but the second draw a few hours later is normal. His vitals show an elevated blood pressure of 200 over 104, heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, and SpO2 are all normal. And then you get an EKG. So this is what it shows. How would you, what stands out here? I know you don't have to go through the whole entire interpretation, but what can you get from this EKG? Perfect, all really quick. That was good. So first thing we look, it looks to be like, I always look at the, the leaves at the bottom because those are the, it's measuring most over time to look at the rate and the rhythm. But this is, look at lead two at the bottom. So we have a P for every QRS. And this is normal sinus rhythm. And then we can look at for, LVH and access. I mean, that's what I see here. Like ABL, there's more than 11 small boxes. And then if we look at V1 and V5 and V6, the tally of those boxes for the deep S wave in VE1 and then the tall R waves in V6, they add up to more than 35 small boxes, which is meets the criteria for LVH. And so this is a patient with a normal sinus rhythm with a signs of LVH and left axis deviation. And also if you, there's something abnormal in the lateral leads. Anybody else see it? What are the lateral leads? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Does anybody know what the lateral leads are? So V5 and V6 are two of them, yes. And then one in ABL. Yeah. So one ABL. So one ABL, V5, and V6 are considered the lateral leads. So there are some ST depressions, slight like T wave inversions, and one ABL, more, and sorry, and it's more clearly seen in V5 and V6. So we would call this. LVH with left axis deviation and sign of strain. So yeah, ventricular strain. Very good, Sabrina. That's what we would we would call it. So I see this EKG pattern quite often. So you may see that. And so that's how we call like so the patient was having chest pain and it was likely due not to like an acute MI or any sort of occlusion, but likely due to their high blood pressure causing some subendocardial ischemia um, and causing that chest pain and slight elevation in their troponin. So getting an echo would help. So it's not a STEMI. Not a STEMI. Yeah. Okay. Commonly encountered arrhythmias. So I got these arrhythmias and the list of them from the pants blueprint. And so you'll see this, these most often, and then likely you'll see them on your EORs as well. And then in real life. And then if you master these, you should be, you should be good to go yeah. for, for the pants and for your exams. Okay. Go ahead. So this is AFib. I'm not going to, I'm going to point out the main thing with these arrhythmias is not to look at everything. We're just looking at the rate and the rhythm pretty much here. We're just seeing like what's going on on a beat to beat basis. And that's how we, this is pattern recognition essentially. So here we have QRS com complexes that are very irregularly spaced. So first off, we know that this is not a normal rhythm. And then we try to look for P waves. I don't see any, I don't know if anybody else sees any, if we look at lead two, we see some T, T waves for sure, but there's no discernible P waves throughout the whole thing. And so this is what we considered defines AFib. So it's an irregular rhythm with irregular QRS complexes and non-discernible P waves. So those vibratory waves are so small that we are not able to see them. And AFib can be very, very fast, very, very slow, or it can just be in a normal range between 60 and 100. So that's AFib. That's very common. And sometimes it's hard. Like I, <laughs> sometimes I struggle with AFib and like, is that a P wave? Is it not? So, you know, like on the textbook, it may make it look really nice and pretty, but in real life, sometimes it's, it can be difficult. And then this is sinus arrhythmia. So this is what Sarah was talking about earlier. So when you take a deep breath in, your heart rate can speed up a little bit. And so it may look like there's an irregular rhythm here, but it's just a normal, normal variant. And so as we can see here on Lee two at the bottom, the rate is a little bit faster initially. There's about three small box, three large boxes between each QRS. And then as we move on, it kind of spaces out, it gets a little slower. So we can assume that the patient's inspiring here and expiring as the, the recording goes on. And, but, you know, we see there's a P for every single QRS. So this is a normal sinus rhythm. It's just a sinus arrhythmia. And this is very common and not abnormal in any way. And I don't think there's anything else glaring on this EKG. T wave inversions in V1 and V2 can be normal. So that doesn't mean that the patient has ischemia right now. 
And then aflutter. So atrial flutter is different than AFib, characterized by these sawtooth waves that we probably all have seen. And it's not always regularly spaced out, the QRS complexes. Sometimes we have a flutter with a variable block, meaning that there's it, there's you know so many flutter waves per QRS and it varies based on each on the beat to beat basis. But here it looks like it's pretty pretty evenly spaced out. There's like you see about three flutter waves for each QRS. So that is atrial flutter. Uh, I don't think I see anything else abnormal in here. Interestingly enough, if you want a fun fact, a flutter can affect the T wave sometimes and kind of tug on it, it like elect, uh, some some way, and it can actually look like the patient has ST elevation by pulling on that T wave and causing a slight abnormality there. So I've had a patient with a flutter and it looked like they had some ST elevation, but they didn't. So. Okay, and everyone's favorite, the heart blocks. So which heart, what type of heart block requires a pacemaker? That's a great question. Third degree, exactly. Yeah. Mobids type two. Good. So those two both and, are in a case. Yeah. And then Go I was just going to say, it's, it's pretty emergent though, when someone comes in at the third degree heart block, a lot of times they'll straight th take them straight to go get a pacemaker. Like they come in the ER, they're in a third degree heart block. And then like the, the same day, they'll get a pacemaker. So it's pretty fast, pretty serious. So at least, the, at least if they're very symptomatic or if they had like a syncopal episode or if their blood pressure is dropping. So just FYI. What does it mean that a flutter is a single excitable electrical focus? It's a great question. Do you mean like- Like coming from one, one then part coming from one foci? Oh, yeah, no, that's what I'm, I guess we're wondering the same thing. Oh, it was a, it's a Ross J question. Ross, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, so it's coming from one part of the atrium. A a atrial fibrillation means it's coming from multiple different foci all over the atria, but I guess with a flutter, it's just coming one foci means one spot or one origin, if that makes sense. Yeah. Foci um, is just a fancy word. Yeah, no problem. I think that's fun. With a flutter, do you still need anticoagulation? Yes, typically. Yeah, you're welcome. So yeah, so for so for a uh, heart block, we we need a pacemaker for second degree mobile type two, and then third degree complete heart block. You know, if a patient patient can third degree is interesting because their heart, it really just all of these, especially if it gets scary and they're like critical. It depends on how often their QRS is beating. Like, I mean, if their QRS is beating between sixteen hundred beats a minute, we're fine. If the QRS is not being like simulated or and the heart's not being contracted that's when it gets scary and their heart rate goes down and they need to be started on medications or sent to the cath lab for a, a temporary pacemaker but so the first degree is normal like anybody it's a normal variant like we don't do really anything with it someone can come in this is an example basically that pr interval i was talking to you about earlier it's prolonged more than five bo small boxes and here it looks very prolonged so we see that t wave here on the two at the bottom and then that P wave is right after, and it's like 10, 11, 12 boxes here. And so that is a first degree AV block. And there's no dropped, there's no like isolated P waves. There should be a P wave for every QRS here. With the second degree, on the other hand, we get, and it's called Mobitz type one. Also, long, I don't know how to say it. Do you know how to say it, Sarah? The long, okay, something walking. I don't know, the W word. <laughs> Wait, keep back. You, yeah, there you go. I, I don't think I ever say that in practice, but anyway, so, so here we have, like, if you look at V1, we have a PR, P wave here, and then QRS, T wave, P wave, QRS, T, but look, the PR intervals are becoming progressively prolonged, which is like classic for this type of AB block. And then right here after the QRS, T, we have a P wave, but there's no QRS. So there's some, there's a block, the, the conduction of electricity has not gotten past the AV node into the ventricles, so there's no depolarization of the ventricles, and so we just have a dropped beat. And so this restarts here, and this P wave does go through, and then we continue that same sort of pattern. And that is classic for this sort of this AV block. And then type two, I couldn't find a good EKG 12 lead on it. I like to do the 12 leads because that's what you'll see most in practice. But here on the ER pants, they may actually just give you rhythm strips. So here we have P wave, QRS, P, and then no QRS, and then P, QRS, P, T, P, QRS, T, P, and then no QRS after that P wave. So it's not, the PR interval is not being prolonged. In fact, it's not prolonged. What's happening is that that P wave is, there's not any conduction through that AV node, and there's just a dropped beat. And then there's, it can be like four to one ratio, or like it, there's different ways we count it to determine the type of block. But this patient will likely need a 
pacemaker if there's not a reversible cause. So that would be a second degree type two. And then what are some, and then, like I said, he, this is third degree A blocks, the most scary. There's no association between the atria contracting and the ventricles contracting. It's very random. There should be no clear pattern here. And that's what we see in this EKG. I can't really see lead two, but we can see that the atria and ventricles are not talking to each other. That's how I see it. And that will need a pacemaker. And then six sinus syndrome is on there. I don't feel like you can technically tell within like a one rhythm strip or one EKG. It's something that we diagnosed over the course of like, you know, patient getting an event monitor. And like we see out through like leads and recordings that they do have like a tachybrady sort of syndrome. They have some pauses. And if the pauses are long enough, they may need a pacemaker. So it's typically seen in older adults. And this is just like a quick kind of run of what that looks like on a very in one time frame. And then SVT, so this is a narrow complex tachycardia. Typically when I see a patient SVT, I don't really see any P waves. They can be hidden, buried in the QRS. They can be hidden in the T wave. They So normally I see a lot of QRS complexes, very narrow, very close together. And it can be as high as like, I've seen up to like 220 beats per minute. And then some can be a little bit slower around 150. And if someone's beating this fast and their heart rate's going really fast, there can also be signs of ischemia. So they can have some SD depression and some, some leads or across all leads. And then PVC. So these are just been kind of just like your heart kind of triggers an extra beat and it's not conducted through the, the electrical conduction system that we talked about earlier. It's very random and it, random in the sense that it's like not as it should be, but it, they can occur in patterns. So we call it like a bigeminy. This is a bigeminy or trigeminy pattern. And if you have a lot of PVCs, you can be at risk for cardiomyopathy. And we treat it a lot of times with beta blockers. And I have a question. Do you look in every leaf for evidence of heart blocks? Typically, no. I, I typically just look on the, the bottom leads that have the entire rhythm strip for me. It should be. And I also will look at the patients. A lot of them are on telemonitors. And so I'll look at the event from the telemonitor and see if there's any evidence of heart block from there. And then PAC, same thing, but coming from the atrium, it should be, it's not wide. So these are very wide and it's cool because some electrophysiologists can tell based on the PVC where exactly it's coming from in the heart, um, which is very neat. But the PACs are coming from the atria. And so it's kind of hard here. You know, if we look at V5, we can see, or let's look at lead two. It's, it's not sinus arrhythmia, but it may kind of seem like it to some people, I mean, sometimes to me too. So if we look at lead two, we see a P wave QRS, pretty long interval there, P and then QRS, and then there's the P wave, but it seems to be really soon after that, that QRS complex. So that's a PAC right here, that, that third beat. And then normal, and that second beat after that is a, a PAC. And if patients have a lot of these, it can almost look like AFib. In fact, patients with a lot of PACs are at increased risk for atrial fibrillation. So, but we don't anticoagulate or anything. We just keep a watch on it. And then left bundle branch block. So a left bundle branch block does not mean MI. Like some people think like, oh my goodness, they have a new onset left bundle branch block. We have to take them to the cath lab. That's not what that means. All it means is that like, if they have a new onset, like, yes, we need to, we need to look for, you know, evaluate them for ischemia, but it's not emergent. There's a criteria we use called the Scarbosso's criteria that can help us determine if they, if a patient with a left bundle is having an MI, and of course we take into consideration the clinical picture, but this is characterized by these deep, deep S, S waves, like we said, in, in S and B1, and then in, in B6, we have, it's an R, R wave or like an RR wave. Like I said, there's so many morphologies to QRS complex and the right, left and right bundle are where you need to know those morphologies and what that means when I say there's like a deep S wave here, and then an RR and B6, and that's classic for a left bundle. And knowing that it's wide, all, a bundle branch block should have a wide QRS. If it doesn't, it's not a bundle branch block. It would be incomplete. So that's that. And it looks like their ST segment elevation, but that's not true. This is why we cannot determine, you know, an MI from a left bundle branch block by just looking like this. And then did I see a right bundle? I think I did. Sorry, I can't hear you, Sarah. You didn't go over right, no. Okay, and then right, it's more common, I see. And so, right, I actually like, it's kind of cool in B1, you have the RSR, and I always think of like bunny ears, it kind of looks like. And then and then in B6, you have an S wave. This one's not that impressive when you look at it, but you have an S sloped in B6. And like I said, a bundle branch block should always be a wide QRS because since one of the bundles is 
blocked, it, the ventricles are taking longer to depolarize, and so that widens that QRS. And that's why you have that there. And then VTAC, we went over this with our tachyarrhythmia lecture. Asks, but what do you see in V6 here? Oh, what the, do last, see? In the last one, I think, in the right bundle. This one? Okay. They're asking, yeah, so, like, what makes it a right bundle, I guess? They're like, what are you looking for in V5 and V6? So in V6, you're looking for an S wave. Like, here in V6, we have a P, we have an R wave with the upward deflection, and then down, we have an S wave. And I said it wasn't impressive, meaning a lot of times it's more defined. It's a little bit deeper and more sloped into the T wave. But for right bundle, I am mostly it, the V1 is what kind of signals you in that it's a right bundle branch block. Thank you. Yeah. And then, oh, and there's a T wave inversion there. And then there's left bundle and then VTAC, Y complex tachycardia. Not all Y complex tachycardia is ventricular tachycardia. You can have, a, if someone has a right bundle branch block and then go into a tachyarrhythmia, it may look wide, but we treat every wide complex tachycardia like it's a ventricular tachycardia, or at least we have to rule it out. So this, like I said, with these really fast rates, it's really hard to look at the P waves. We just look at the QRS here and we see that it's very wide and very fast. And, and would this be we... monomorphic or polymorphic to everybody? Okay, sir. Yeah, I think Kristen knows. Okay, good. Because each yeah. morphology looks the same. Good. And then another thing, just FYI, Kristen and I went over tachyarrhythmias, how to approach them, like stable and unstable tachyarrhythmias in a previous lecture. And it's on the Mighty Works Network if you want to go over that. Because right now we're not going to go over how to treat this. But if you need a refresher, just go over a lecture. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Daniel, I like your all cap. Tachyarrhythmia, Zoom, but, um, you know, it's not very, I don't see it a lot. I'm glad I don't because it's pretty scary. This is what it looks like. And also know that some people may think someone's in BFib, but it's just artifacts. They could be shivering. Their leads could be messed up. So, you know, if you walk in, they're like, the patient's in BFib, and they're like walking and talking, and they're in no distress. Probably not BFib. And so that's the commonly encountered arrhythmias. Does anybody have any questions about those? It should all be pattern recognition. I got an EKG when I was learning this. I got an EKG app on my phone and was just I went through a lot of arrhythmias and it like quizzed me if I could recognize the pattern. And I just went through that a lot. Do you use the turn signal when looking for blocks? I don't know what the turn signal is. Do you remember the name of the app? I mean, and then life, you... life in the fast lane is EKG website. I'm sure y'all have heard of, and they have a lot of EKGs you can look through a lot of like cases and it's very helpful. I can show you, I deleted the app, but I you can deleted oh. it. Well, I, was like, I don't need it anymore. <laughs> I was running out of storage on my phone, but I can, I can, I'll let y'all know. I, I'll post it. And then lastly, signs of ischemia. So this is very important. This is what, why I get sent EKGs to look at is because we need to know if a patient's having an acute ischemia and then people get concerned, rightly so, if something shows up acute MI on the EKG interpretation. So the signs of ischemia that, that are most commonly, you know, encountered are ST elevation, ST depression, T wave inversion, and then Q waves. I won't go over Q waves because it gets, we don't have time, but I would know what a pathological Q wave is and why it's important um, and what a not normal Q wave is because having a Q wave in B1 and B2 is actually normal. And so ST elevation criteria. So like I said before, we're looking at, we have that J point, which is the end of the QRS complex. And then we, we compare that ST segment to a flat line, typically the PR interval. So look at the PR interval and compare that height to the ST segment. And if it's higher than it, it's elevated. If it's lower than it, it's depressed. And, and we measure that in the width of those small boxes. And if it reaches a certain height or a certain depth, it's considered like pathologic, like ST depression, ST elevation. So the criteria kind of, I don't know if you'll go over this in school, we didn't, but it's actually different for males and females and age. So this, I would, Verify, but this is what I go off of in practice is these, this criteria here. I am not going to go through all of it, but like if I have a 40 year old, 42 year old male who comes in with chest pain and it has EKG show some ST changes, I'm looking at something greater than two millimeters or two small boxes and V2 and V3. And then I, all the other leads, I'm looking for something greater than one millimeter in terms of ST elevation or one small box. And then here, so you have to know what leads correspond with which artery and what we call that. So like when someone kind of comes in with acute MI, we don't know, like typically, like we can guess which artery is affected and cardiologists do a great job of guessing if it's the RCA, if it's the left circumflex, if it's the left anterior descending, if, if it's like the left main, but you know, 
we, we guess. So we call it like, it's an anterior MI, it's an inferior MI, it's a lateral MI until we send them to the cath lab and we can be like, okay, yeah, this patient had a hundred percent occlusion in their RCA. So making sure, you know, like leads two, three and ABF is if that's elevated on EKG and they have an MI, it's called an inferior MI. They go to the cath lab and we assume, and it's probably most likely that their RCA is occluded because that's what that's those leads are kind of covering that anatomy in a sense. So, you know, lateral would be what, what artery is typically associated with a lateral MI LC. Lesser, very good. I like your, yeah, that was good. Less circumflex. Yeah. And an anterior MI would be what, what artery LAD. Good. And then like, very good. And you know, there's like something called like high lateral MIs and it can be, can get kind of complicated, but this is the, the basics of it. And so, and knowing the reciprocal leads. So if we have ST elevation, like for example, in leads two, three and ABF, what can we expect in leads one and ABL? What, what would we see as a sign of like reciprocal changes? So if I have a patient that has ST elevation in two, three and ABF, and they're having an inferior MI, I can expect ST depression good in one and ADL. It may not always be so, but it it's something you can look for. And then this picture, sorry, shows kind of like the, how the leads kind of line up with the anatomy and where those arteries are. And that's why it's that way. And then this picture up here to the top right is very helpful for me. And, you know, I think on the pants in the ER, they do a great job of, you know, making it very clear what the distribution of the, the, where that ST elevation is occurring. I never felt confused by that. Like here, for example, this patient's having what type of MI on this EKG that I show here in black and white and fear. Good. So like if we look at lead three, we take that, there's a slight little Q wave there. It's tiny, so it's probably not pathologic. And then the R wave. And then right when we get to that J pointer, the end of the QRS segment, we have this kind of upsloping. And if we compare that point to where the PR interval, that's like, what, like four, three or four small boxes. So it's definitely pathologic. And that's in leads two, three, and ABF. So this patient's having an inferior MI. And then we can see some reciprocal changes as well. I've covered a little bit of it up. I'm sorry. And then here we have an example of an anterior stim. Like we have, we have the ST elevation in leads B1, B2, B3, B4, B5. You can even see a little bit in the lateral leads as well in one ADL in X. And this is very clear, these tombstone appearances. And then here we have an example of a lateral semi. These are a little bit trickier, but essentially like we learn like laterals one ABL B5 and B6, but it, you know, there's a lot more that goes into this, but we see ST elevation in B5, B6 for sure. And then some ST depression, which is some reciprocal changes in the anterior leads. And so a lot of patients that do come in with chest pain, that's very bad and resistant to nitroglycerin. And I get serial EKGs because things change. Like a patient's EKG can change over hours. Like I had a case the other week and a patient came with crushing chest pain, no cardiac history. EKG initially looked okay, nothing like too concerning, but we got an EKG like an hour later and it was a very clear inferior lateral MI. And so we sent him straight to the cath lab. So that's something a lot of cardiologists will recommend is like doing EKGs every few hours as well as the troponin lab draw. And then high yield here is that horizontal or downsloping is more signs of ischemia. Whereas like just upsloping is not too much to be concerned about. C depression does not always mean like they're having an acute plaque occlusion or something like maybe their heart's working extra hard and they're in a tachyarrhythmia. And so they have some, some ST depression on their EKG. And so that's that. And then here's an example, uh, like we showed in some of the other EKGs here, they have ST depression and leads V3, V4, V5, V6. I can't see all the leads, but those are the most clear to find. What rhythm do you think this is? Does anybody know? Is it normal sinus? I think that's a good first question. Is it? I mean, the QRS looks pretty irregular to me. It looks like AFib. Yeah. I would call it AFib. I don't see any discernible P waves. It looks, the QRS complexes look irregular. There's no P waves in, in embedded in the QRS or the T waves. So I would call it AFib. And then T wave inversion. So patients have inverted T waves. That doesn't always mean ischemia. There's other things that can cause it as well. But that is, if patients coming with chest pain and you're concerned about ischemia, then that's something you should consider. Strokes are one thing that can cause inverted T waves. So a patient comes in with acute hemorrhagic stroke, they can have T wave inversions across their EKG leads. But here, this EKG actually got from a patient that had an MI and went to the cath lab, and then this is their EKG after. But they have diffuse T wave inversions that are pretty significant, especially lead V3 that are signs of ischemia. 
So that was it in a nutshell. I went kind of fast towards the end because I want to be respectful of everybody's time. I'm going to send out information about the app and then Sarah's going to create the worksheet about the electrolyte abnormalities and what we see on EKG. And then I'll also do a few practice EKG. I can make them hard if you want. Or do you want like, I don't know what, I make, I make them pretty challenging if you want to have a challenge. <laughs> like you don't have enough already. But, and I can send it out so so you can do them on your own time and then I'll post the answers in about a week. If anybody has any questions about any of the things I just ran through really quickly. How commonly do you see Wellens? Oh, Wellens, okay. I've seen Wellens once. Wellens is, if anybody doesn't know, it's a certain finding on EKG, it typically leads V2 and V3. That is like a sense, like they likely have severe LA, like left main disease or LAD occlusion and we like, very concerning. So we have to send them to the cath lab. I had that once. I haven't seen it before that. And then Brugada, I've never seen a Brugada. So I check, I look. I think I had um, once. There was did one you have person. One? Yeah. Had a history of Brugada. Yeah. But it, but it never on my notes, like Brugada. Like I, I have not seen that before. Has anybody else seen Brugada or anything else very interesting on an EKG before? I don't think anybody else has. Yeah. So don't see that too often, but well, I have seen once. Any other questions about anything EKG related? If not, you can message me directly or Sarah as well. Let's see. Oh, a lot of them are asking where can we access this recording? So on the mindynetworks.com, you can like log into the Smarty Pants thing. If you have questions on that, I think there should be, I think Stephen posted a link on the Instagram, um, but Mining Networks is like the community you can join for free. And then we have a study group called PA Twin Talks, and that's where we post practice questions. We post all the recordings and all like worksheets and stuff like that. So if you go to the Mining Networks page, you go to study groups, and then you can join PA Twin Talks, and that's where you can access the recording. I'll probably upload it tomorrow or tonight if I have time during work. But yes, and thanks for listening. Kristen is the queen of EKG, so I let her... She did great. I hope you all learned a lot. If you have any questions, let us know. EKG stuff is a lot of times just like practicing over and over again. Just like keep looking at EKG. So thank you all so much. For Thanks for time. listening. Y'all take care. Good luck to everyone who has exams. Yeah, good luck on, next. don't have finals. Good luck on that. Bye, everybody.